Welcome everyone to NJSL and our presentation on our Rutgers Schoen Fellows Action Research. We are very excited to bring you this project. As you know, it is um, in memory and honor of our Dr. Ross J. Todd from Rutgers, who is one of our founders of Sizzle at, at Rutgers. And so we're very honored to bring you some new researchers who are creating some waves in the world of school librarianship. These researchers are all fellows in the Beverly E. Schoen Research Fellowship. Um, the fellowship, of course, uh, supports their graduate work and is looking for projects that are innovative and also new research that's needed in the field of school librarianship. The fellowship is established by the Carol A. and Norman Barham Family Foundation's donation to Sizzle. And if you follow the foundation, you will see that they are very generous in their grants to a variety of topics um, from education as well as health and social services. So our goal uh, with the fellowship, of course, is to build a culture of student research, professional leadership, contribution, and innovation. And we're looking again uh, for projects that are relating to dynamic school student learning in school libraries in the information age. So today you're going to get to meet some of our recent graduates and some of our current fellows as well. We're going to hear from Melissa Rivera, Jessica Chica, Yulia Abova, Zach Arlt, and I'm going to tell you about some projects of some of our fellows who couldn't be here today, Kellyanne Healy, Harmony Birch, and Jen Murray. Before I go into that, I want to show you just a little bit about how we at Rutgers support our Shown Fellowship. And I, I don't think I introduced myself. I'm Dr. Brenda Boyer, and I am currently the advisor, mentor, and as I like to call myself, head cheerleader for our Shown Fellows to help them uh, work through their project. So one of the major pieces um, that we put in place was to create a Canvas platform um, so that our students had a place to work, receive feedback, um, present their deliverables, and so on. We support them with lots of wonderful research tools, of course, everything uh, provided by Rutgers, of course, as well as our research lib guide that has uh, lots of help and inspiration in action research. So those are just some of the tools that our fellows use as they delve into their projects. This, of course, is our school library MJ lib guide um, developed by our own Dr. Joyce Valenza. And this is a, a wonderful tool that is absolutely indispensable to our fellows as well as practitioners across New Jersey. So some of the ways that we uh, support our researchers is getting them started with their proposal, which is a, a pretty basic essay to get them started, to get the ball rolling. Each and every one of the fellows you're going to meet today spent a lot of time thinking about their project and exploring different research avenues before settling on their final uh, project. And of course, when they're ready to delve into action research, we provide them with the protocol and report writing steps that is recommended from Treasure Mountain Canada as a, a really wonderful protocol and tool to use for action research in school libraries. And Dr. Valenza, I wanna invite you if you want to make any comments, please jump in anytime. Yeah, for for well. people who are listening to this, um, we're using our, our students as an example, but action research can happen in any school library yes. program. You just look for the problems that you think are most worthy of solving. And now you have a toolkit and some models of, of how you might address these issues. So move Absolutely. your program forward. Thanks. Absolutely. And of course, along the way, um, the students, uh, lucky for them, get to spend a lot of time talking with me um, online, talking about their projects. And it's really, I must tell you, such an incredible joy to get to know them. I've known most of them as students in our various um, LIS classes at Rutgers. But for me, it has been such a privilege. I just wanted to say that to really get to know you all at a much more personal level along the way. When our students are ready to wrap it up, 
after their fabulous projects and creations are made, um, they do leave us with one final reflection video and our uh, LibGuide is going to give you the link um, out to that as well. So you can not only see their projects, but um, hear a little bit about their journeys. So I'm gonna start um, talking about a couple of our fellows. Uh, the QR code that you see on each screen is um, the QR that will take you to um, the project of each student um, and will give you the array of wonderful resources they've created. Kellyanne Healy's a recent graduate and her project was on international children's um, book celebration that she held at Lake Hiawatha Library where she is now employed, I believe full time. Uh, she did a wonderful job. I was able to go actually visit while the program was going on in her library. Uh, she amassed this incredible array of international children's books uh, from all over the state, as well as from her library for the celebration. And then they invited families um, to bring their children, of course, to the event. And some of the presenters were the children from the community who were so thrilled to get up and read a book um, in their, their native language. It was really a wonderful event to witness. And Kellyanne worked on this project through her, her year. And she also had a lot of excellent advice from our Dr. Mark Aronson as well, who of course is an, an expert in international children's books. So Kellyanne couldn't be here today, but she is working over at Lake Hiawatha. Another one of our graduates is Harmony Birch. And Harmony developed a LibGuide for us, and that, of course, is the QR to the link. Um, you can see there on the right how she laid out her LibGuide. Um, and she was talking about Know Your Source, New Jersey. The entire focus of Harmony's project was looking at how do we really teach our students to evaluate resources? And so you can see by um, her list of topics there that she also gathered and created some lesson plans um, from kindergarten all the way through 12th grade and amassed an incredible amount of tools for school librarians to immediately take and use. And another student who isn't with us today because she, um, her husband is now stationed in Germany, is Jen Murray. And Jen Murray um, is a wonderful librarian, and she was a homeschool parent. Uh, that's her with her own four kiddos that she homeschooled while her husband was stationed in New Jersey. She developed um, her Schoen Fellowship project, looking at not only gathering resources that are really high quality for homeschool parents, but she took a, a good look in her action research focused on how, um, how much and to what degree do school librarians have an opportunity to work with homeschool parents. And so um, that sort of opened a floodgate for her to see that um, overall, there wasn't a lot going on, at least in her home state, and so that drove her to create a live guide that has all types of excellent resources, but also focuses on and encourages homeschool parents to reach out to librarians, whether they are their local school librarians or public librarians. So she did a fantastic job with that. All right, so now we have some of our fellows here in person. And so I'm very happy to have them come up. And we're doing really well on time. So feel free to speak <laughs> as long as you want. I'll use a big phone if I want to. So we're going to have Alyssa Rivera come up first. And of course, that's a QR to Alyssa's LibGuide that she created on the issue of equity. So Alyssa, come on up. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Alyssa Rivera. I am a new school librarian, just started this year in a kindergarten through sixth grade elementary school in Saddlebrook, New Jersey. Um, over the past year, I guess, I was doing research on equity. Um, I am a person of color. I'm Puerto Rican. My parents lived in New York, but my grandparents all came from Puerto Rico. Um, so growing up, I didn't really see a lot of myself in the books that I was reading in school. And so I decided that this was the topic that I wanted to cover. Um, so I titled my project Bridging Gaps in Equity. 
um, for school libraries. And so in my research, I decided to focus on three gaps and bridging those gaps. So I focused on monetary gaps, representation gaps, and access gaps. And that's the way that my LibGuide is sort of organized. So you can click on either gap that, you know, suits what you need to find for your school. Um, before starting, I did decide to come up with my own definition of equity, um, just to have a base point and a touch point to follow all throughout the LibGuide. Um, so on the side there, that was my working definition. I'm not going to read it all because it's kind of long, um, but it is kind of an amalgamation of a lot of different research that has been done on equity and diversity and representation in schools. Um, so I will just talk briefly about each of the gaps and what's on the LibGuide, um, and then I guess you can look at it for yourself if you desire. So um, the monetary gaps, I focused mostly on finding grants and awards that you can apply to um, to help funding for your school. Um, the research shows that a lot of schools that do not have that funding um, are schools that have a lot of students of color. And so, you know, as a librarian in a school like that, I am at a Title I school. Um, it is important for me to be finding those grants and awards to get those books in the hands of the children that need them. Um, and also, it's not just about books, it's also about technology and access to, you know, all types of educational resources. So there are grants for STEM opportunities, um, for, you know, books, of course, and things like that. So there's a long list, and I've been updating it as the time goes on, so it will be updated. Um, as well as that, I have also listed books on funding that you can purchase from the ALA store. And hopefully they will come out with some more recent ones as they are a little bit older, but you know, fingers crossed. So <laughs> um, that was the monetary gaps for representation gaps. Um, I put a link to a wakelet made by Jazel with all types of resources for finding books, for getting books that are diverse and representative of your students. Um, I also linked to a video made by Dr. Sims Bishop of course, we all know her and we all love her. Windows, mirrors, and sliding glass doors. So that is super big, super important. So I put a link to that video. And then I also have a small little section on diversity audits. So it will tell you how to start a diversity audit. There are links to resources for spreadsheets to keep track of yours, um, tips and tricks and all that kind of stuff. So if that's something that you've been wanting to do, it's something that I will do hopefully soon. Um, there is all links to those resources as well. Um, and then lastly, there are access gaps. So in that I have the library has more than four walls. So what happens when your students are on winter break, on summer break, when they're at home and they don't have access to the library at school? What can you do? Um, so I have that. I have homeschooling, which I got help from Jen Murray, who's on the last slide. Um, so all about, you know, supporting reading for homeschooling parents um, and resources for you and for them as well. Um, I have a link to collaboration with public and school librarians. So working together, you know, it's always better together, I think. So that is very awesome and you know super important especially when you're not in school you know the public library is there it's open all year round so you can help direct your students to that resource as well um and then last i just have a little note on fees and fines and how that can restrict access for certain students in your schools um oh and yes there's also the book awards and book links and all that fun stuff so we need diverse books is on there so you know Oh, no. Anyway, um, <laughs> I know I, she's been on my brain since forever. So I was super excited to meet her yesterday. Um, so yeah, if you want to check out the LibGuide, there's a ton of information on there. I have a bibliography of all the research I did. Um, so thank you. <laughs> all right. Next, we have Jess Pacheco. And if you were lucky enough to be here yesterday, Jessica actually did a full session where she got to talk about her project. So if you don't mind just sharing some more with us, come on out. Sure. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Jessica DiCicco, Dr. Boyer. Thank you for that introduction and, um, and for specifically your enthusiasm and support throughout the process of this project. So I just want to acknowledge your you. contributions, which are significant. Um, and uh, 
So in keeping with the theme of the conference, <clears throat> the world of stories, I'll just give you a little bit of my story, which fed into why I chose to do this. <laughs> me. So my background is in ecological restoration. Um, I, would, I worked in the different areas of New Jersey and then also the wilds of Brooklyn in Prospect <laughs> Park for many years. Uh, doing uh, restoration work, like trying to improve the uh, function and the future of the natural areas there. Um, when I had my kids, I uh, got into outdoor education for young children, so like the under eight crowd, uh, doing uh, classes in the park nearby my house, and um, and so and I got to experience the joy of helping families get outside, connect with nature, and um, and use the outdoors as a classroom where they could play and explore and learn how to interact with one another. They can learn how to like what risks they can take and which ones maybe they shouldn't. And, you know, sort of explore a lot of important early childhood lessons. Um, so through these experiences, not only did I come to have a greater understanding of the natural world and greater appreciation for it, but I also learned what an incredibly rich educational uh, environment that nature can be. Um, so, you know, nature can be both stimulating and calming at the same time. Um, it has a way, uh, it's a wonderful place for young people to explore and to learn. And it's well documented that there are a number of different benefits uh, to your own person of being outside in nature. Everything from health benefits such as uh, lower blood pressure and more, you know, white blood cells to, uh, you know, mental health benefits to the point that, you know, the professor from um, the Harvard School of Public Health recommends that everyone get a daily dose of nature. Um, you know, it's it's uh, improving symptoms of ADHD in children. Um, so there's a number of great reasons why we should be thinking about these things. And I think that, and so for my project, I wanted to explore how could I tie this world that I loved of like outdoors, of being in the woods, with this new world that I was studying about of being a librarian. I said, there, there has to be a way we can bring these two things together. And I believe that librarians do have an opportunity to lead in our schools to bring new opportunities, you know, new ideas, new opportunities to our teachers. And, um, and I think, um, so that's why I wanted to create this loop guide. So um, this was became the, the result of all of these different ideas that were floating around in my head. Um, so I'll give you sort of a brief summary of what's on there. And I do hope that it becomes a launching pad for people to then, you know, say like, this sounds like a good idea. What can I do? And so hopefully we'll have lots of, you'll get inspired by what's on here and decide to try some things in your own uh, educational situations. Um, so I considered various aspects and this is by no means, um, comprehensive. <laughs> I think it's a work in progress, but um, I thought of different sources of, of ideas. So from, I thought of things from the public library realm. Many public libraries were doing outdoor activities during COVID. So um, that was, you know, one place to draw inspir inspiration. One of my favorite ideas from there was the walking book club, where you could uh, walk and talk and they take some of the social anxiety of sitting in that room with people looking at what are they going to think of what I said. This way we can, you know, we can take a walk, we'll be relaxed, we can get the fresh air and the sunshine, and we'll talk about the book at the same time. <laughs> and I think that's just, and, and that was one of my favorite ideas that I discovered in this whole process. Um, you know, other things like, uh, uh, so then curricular ties. So we wanted to tie into programs you already have in the schools and, you know, things that teachers could do. Um, one would be, you know, there's some more obvious things like going to like open air museums. You know, we have like historic villages and things like that. But some other things like maybe like facilitating a giant bubble event outside <laughs> um, when your science teachers want to explore certain concepts where bubbles can be a great example. Why instead of doing a small dish in your classroom, why not go outside and make that a memorable, sticky learning experience? Um, so trying to find ways to um, to just bring you know bring classes outdoors. And, uh, and so other things, incorporating tech tools, or, <laughs> um, like using plant identification uh, apps to like do a scavenger hunt through either a natural area or even in your schoolyard. You know, like what can you find? How many different plants, you know, insects, things like that. Um, 
the, I have a tab about designing outdoor spaces. If you're lucky enough to be a librarian who's thinking about um, what an outdoor space might be, um, I've got some inspiration in there of how you can, um, you know, design with, uh, you know, outdoor learning out, you know, in mind, right? Um, there's suggestions for read-alouds and nature-related crafts, um, as well as professional development training opportunities for teachers, um, all on the different tabs. And my, if you might be wondering what if all else fails is, <laughs> um, and that one is, so I realize that many of us are going to be limited by, um, you know, the ability to take a class outside. Maybe that, you know, just doesn't work for your administration. It just doesn't work. I think that every little bit counts. And so you, the, there are solutions. Well, the first one I would say would be bring in natural materials to your classroom um, and try to incorporate those things. Because, you know, kids love like fidgets and things, but like, what's a better fidget than a pine cone? And I have some of you like to take one with you. <laughs> um, there's, there's beauty and complexity in natural materials that are, it's very stimulating. So that's one, you know, bringing in house plants into your library, creating your own little jungle in there um, and having students learn to take care of them. My husband's a social studies or was a social studies teacher in a middle school when this happened, that he had a spider plant that had little babies and one of his students, um, they did it together, like they rooted it, they, you know, put it in a pot, they grew it. And at the end of the year, Davon took little Davon home with him <laughs> and had a new interest, you know, that's nature related and learning how to take care of things. Am I over? Almost okay. <laughs> okay, I'm almost there. Okay, so uh, and it, uh, let's see. I think we that. So one more thing. So consider if you have little ones. Also, um, oh wait, but I didn't get to an all else spells. But okay, back with the natural materials. Uh, consider the ubiquitous sentence strip in elementary schools. Add a little double sided tape and some free natural materials from outside. <laughs> some leaves, some flower petals, and suddenly you have amazing unique crowns for your wild rumpus when you read where the wild things are. You have your kings and queens of the wild things. And, you know, just dealing with these natural materials, I think, makes a difference. So I hope that people do take advantage um, to take a chance to explore this lip guide. Um, I did do the spark and share yesterday also. So if you look through Sketch, the link will be in there as well. Um, and I hope you're inspired to go out and help children make these connections because being in nature can benefit you, it can benefit your students, and planting the seeds with our young people that care about nature can benefit the planet as a whole. So awesome. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And we're going to continue on a theme of exploration. Zach, come on up. This is Zach Burl. He's going to talk to us about museum and object-based learning. Yes. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Zach Arlt. Um, I am also a recent graduate of the MI program. I am now a sixth through eighth grade middle school librarian in Perth Amboy. Um, before I was a school librarian, my background is in museum education. So since 2019, I was either an intern, an educator, or um, most recently a program coordinator with the Smithsonian Associates down in Washington, DC, um, which is the Smithsonian's um, largest nonprofit education wing, um, not connected to any specific museum. So we got to go and work across all 19 and counting Smithsonian museums. <laughs> um, so one thing that I wanted to really think about when I was starting this project was how could I um, find ways to use what I have learned and what I practiced in museum education in the library. Uh, and there are plenty of ways because museum education, much like what we learn about in um, our LIS classes, is grounded in constructivism, right? So um, students and learners building knowledge in active ways um, with hands-on activities. So I sought to figure out how I could bring some of that um, museum education worlds into the school library. So the first thing that I did was I actually made an index for the different museums that are currently open in New Jersey. Um, they are, it's recent as of February of last year. Um, much like libraries, museums are kind of coming back from COVID still and a lot of museums closed because actually a lot of the museums not just in New Jersey, but around the country are run um, by a team of volunteers that you know might have one full-time staff member. Um, and it could be a local historical society with a one-room kind of archive and small rotating exhibit, um, but they have 
usually great resources and great educational um, opportunities for your students. Um, so I tried to put together an index with all of those different museums uh, broken out by counties for the state. Uh, and then they also have some ideas for curriculum connections. So I tried to go through if you have, I know my school has a local history um, part of their social studies curriculum. So a lot of the connections for that index are for local history. Um, so then also I curated and created some different lessons for using museum objects in your library. And most of the time in the museum, we have the object in front of us, but pictures work just as well. You can still do all of those high level thinking activities with pictures. Um, and even if you have a maker space, creating representations with found and recycled materials. Um, when I was working in the museums, that was one thing that we loved to do. We would go into the gallery, we would see the object, we would talk about the object, we would write down notes, we would do all of the thinking, and then we would come back to our classroom, and then we would kind of dump out a bunch of recycled materials and say, okay, let's cre recreate it, let's make it, let's see what we can do, think about how they used it, what materials they were using, how do materials matter? So it gets them thinking about material culture um, and ways that um, we as creators of different objects are very intentional and sometimes not intentional, but intentional about the materials that we use. Um, so there are a few different lessons that I've used um, and a few different lessons that I've found. Um, one ob or one lesson about object-based learning that I use is think like a curator, and that's one that we do all the time at the Smithsonian. Um, so we use um, Harvard Project Zero's thinking, uh, visible thinking protocol, see, think, wonder. So you start out with um, an object or a picture, and you write down all the details that you see. What what do you notice? What um, is it made out of? just going off of what you can see, and then you move to what do those details mean? So can you make any meaning out of what you're seeing? And then finally, you go to what do you wonder? And um, that's probably the most important part, and especially as a school librarian, that would be one of the most important parts because it's a really great way to start getting students to generate questions and to generate uh, curiosities that they could then take on to further research projects. Um, so I have a lesson where I use uh, Oni the Postal Dog. So he was the mascot of the U.S. postal system uh, in the 1890s. Um, and I actually just did this lesson with my sixth graders recently um, because he's preserved in the National Postal Museum. <laughs> so he is on display. Um, and, you know, sixth graders really love looking at a preserved dog from a hundred years ago. Um, he's, he's a little weird to look at. Um, and so... Uh, getting to have that conversation, but then also talk about the um, the collar that he wears because he has this vest with all kinds of different medals and you can zoom in on the different medals um, and see that he traveled all around the world and all around the country and talk about, we talked about the Transcontinental Railroad and started getting into some social studies content. Um, so that's one lesson that I have. I also have a lesson on the type of museums. Um, I also tried to develop a set of cards that you could take to any museum to kind of have as a field trip um, that you could hand out to the kids and they give them different actions and activities to do in that exhibit. Um, it was actually adapted from a college art history class um, that I actually found in Dr. V's class on one of our open education portals. Um, so kind of taking that and figuring out how we could use it for K-12 students. Um, and it's something that we actually used, um, not in that specific way with the cards, but taking the activities that we used at the Smithsonian um, when we go on our field trips to figure out how we can give them to librarians who would be a great place um, to coordinate those field trips for students because it usually cuts across different curriculums um, and different content areas to be able to be leaders uh, in those experiences. Um, that's good. Okay. Uh, and, okay. Yeah. Um, and that was, uh, that was it. Yeah. I did want to mention, I'm not sure if you said it there, that Zach did take the time and he actually did a crosswalk with all the ASL standards and object-based learning and gives you concrete examples for every standard, wow. which was an incredible undertaking. I forgot so, about thank that. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. All right, and next we're going to hear from Yulia. Come on up, Yulia Boba. Her project was going, um, her action research involved going through the experience of 
work, working with an elementary school and a principal for a redesign of the space. It was, it was. Hi, thank you for uh, that lovely introduction. I am Yulia and I have all sorts of notes here, but I will probably just babble on because this project is near and dear to my heart. Um, when I was talking to my 11 year old last night, I said to him, Max, I'm so nervous about this. And so he says to me, no, just imagine everybody in the audience has potatoes. <laughs> and I, I guess the whole naked people is a little, you know, not that. It's more funny than coming for an 11 year old. And so I, I thought, I, I sat with that and I'm like, yeah, but these are not potatoes. These are way cooler. These are public like, or school librarians and they, they care about these things. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to think of them as school librarians who care about spaces, who care about, you know, how we can make a library space better for our kiddos. How can we make it more interactive, more engaging, and more exciting for them all to be in? So um, I started by talking to the elementary librarian in the school where my own kids went to. Um, and I've known her for a while. And there's another connection. She's the reason I'm in the Rutgers program. She sort of inspired me to go down this path and go on this journey. Um, so she's phenomenal. And so I said, I came to her and I said, how can I help? I have this research project in front of me. It's pretty much open-ended. I was told I can do whatever. So what can I do to make these children's library experiences better? And so we talked about different things that we could do, but ultimately came down to the fact that the library space, and you can see that's that's the before. This is the what it it looked like before we started. And it's a nice big spacious area. So um, kids are happy to be there, but it's old, right? It hasn't been updated in 20 years. And it's just, it can do a thing, it can use a facelift. It can do just more excitement. It needs to be more modern. Um, so we talked about different things we could do. Um, and we started reaching out to the principal and to the board of education members. And this was an ongoing process and it went on and on and on for so long. I It was over a year. We kept talking, we kept emailing, we kept reaching out and reminding. And it was sort of, it was very frustrating because it's like, but you care about students. You know that a library space will make the students' experience better. It will make their learning experiences better. So it was very frustrating at times. Um, I did find several muralists and local artists that had come out to the space and they said, this is what we can do. And one of them, this is actually the winning sketch. Um, the, the artist who did the sketch used to be the art teacher at this elementary school. Now she teaches at the high school in the same district. So there was that connection of, she can come in and she really knows her students and she can come in and bring something beautiful with her. Um, and so just because of the time constraints, um, that was not, that was supposed to have happened this summer, but the library space was not painted until closer to August. And we didn't know about it until after it had been painted because the librarian kept emailing and nothing was happening and nobody was selling or anything. And so this is happening over next summer and we're very excited. And I think this is going to be just, it's gorgeous. I, I'm obsessed with this painting. It's, it's wonderful. Um, and so a couple of things that sort of came out of this as we did our research, as we dug and saw how we can improve his face. We, of course, we obviously went to David Thornburg, Berg, sorry. Uh, we looked at, you know, the kind of spaces that already exist here and campfires. Um, yes, uh, the lecture style was actually already in place. Um, the watering no, I'm sorry, the, yes, campfires. <laughs> I got this. Uh, watering holes where students work together in groups um, that already exist. So there's those tables and they work in groups a lot. And so we're missing caves, which is a place, sort of a quiet space where a student can come and process things or learn quietly by themselves. And life spaces where they can take things they've learned and they can bring them to life and they can, you know, explore by tinkering and whatnot. So those two spaces are still missing. And that's sort of our next step in, you know, trying to convince the admin that this is needed very much so. Um, so we looked into research on colors. We ended up um, with pale yellow walls and there's uh, the trimmings are light blue. So um, those colors have been found to increase motivation and intellectual activity in children. So that was a very fun um, little on a finding here. And so our next step is convincing the admin that we need new flexible furniture because those are old and super heavy and you can do anything with them if you wanted to rearrange the space, if you wanted to use the space in a different manner than, you know, your typical library learning. So um, for that, we are, 
I'm proposing we form a committee because ultimately what it came down to and what I came to learn about this, and we talk about advocacy in library school so much, but it's sort of a vague notion of, oh yeah, of course, of course, advocacy, we should all care about libraries. But it is so much more needed. It is so much more important than I think we even emphasize in school because this library is beloved. The librarian, everybody loves her, everybody knows her, everybody's very happy to see her. Kids, so this is elementary and they're there once a week, but they love being there. For the most part, I see these kids, they're, oh, look at these books, and they're very excited, but we can make it better for them, right? And we can make it better by bringing the community and bringing stakeholders together and forming a committee and then kind of moving this forward with um, acquiring new furniture, something more flexible, something more movable. That's hopefully with a bit more color because that's a little a little boring. Um, and then working on some sort of a makerspace situation that can be shared, like a movable sort of makerspace that can be shared with three other elementary schools in the district. This way it gets cheaper. Yep. Um, and yeah, advocacy. Let's help librarians. All right. <laughs> All right, and so now we continue on with our Shun Fellowship. We have a new crop of fellows that have just joined us this semester, um, and these are their tentative projects that they spend their first semester doing a lot of research and a lot of thinking. Some people have done interviews, they're thinking about focus groups already, even as they're developing the project. So um, Lou Lynch is looking at social-emotional learning in school libraries. Um, Lee Lamore is looking at getting to know yourself, creating a core curriculum for student libraries around the topic of puberty. And we are fortunate to have two of our new fellows today. So I'm going to ask you to both come up if you don't mind. So this is Kate, Matthew, and Rachel Elmer, two of our new fellows. And so we have just a few minutes. So if you could just tell us your project and your motivation, why you'd like to do it, whatever you'd like to share. Sure. Sure. Hi, I'm Rachel. Um, I currently work as a college counselor. I've helped high schoolers apply to college for the last almost 14 years. When I started this program, I thought it would have nothing to do with what I ultimately did, which was, as it turns out, very dumb. Because the more I learned about information literacy, the more I realized that actually the college application process is just that, plus research, plus reflection, plus basically the AASL standards. Like, we should be teaching it. Um, but we're not. And in, in, some places we, in some places we are, right? And so um, this is particularly an equity issue, too. The high schoolers I work with who go to under-resourced high schools might have a school counselor in their building twice a week. Uh, for four or 500 students. Um, those are the students who are having much less equitable college access outcomes. And I really believe that school librarians could play a big role in bridging that gap because of the expertise we have. Um, so my research project is gonna be centered on one, trying to establish what is so, what is actually happening because I've spoken to some high school librarians who are like, yeah, I, I met one yesterday who said, I basically run the college counseling office and they love it and we are so collaborative. Um, which was amazing. I, more often I meet high school librarians who are like, oh, they don't want me to touch that with a 10 foot pole um, or who are interested, but it just it's just not happening. So um, Dr. Boyer is hopefully going to help me do some focus groups because I don't know how to do focus groups <laughs> um, to sort of figure out what's happening and what might be the barriers to that collaboration. And then I hope to develop a toolkit informed by those focus groups to help high school counselors and librarians collaborate in that process. Excellent, thank you. Um, so I'm Kate Maté. Uh, I'm focusing on digital citizenship and forming the next generation. Um, when tasked with the idea of starting what I was gonna do my project on, Dr. Boyer said, well, you know, what's important to you? And I have two little boys and uh, my six-year-old just entered kindergarten and already has a computer. Um, and you know, I asked him the first couple of days, he was so excited, mom, my fourth grade buddy, he came, he helped me set up my computer, we're doing these games, I said, oh, okay, great, like, did anybody talk to you about, like, what you should be using the computer for, or what you should not, well, no, we're just playing games, man, we're just doing these things, and I said, oh, okay, then a few weeks went by, hey, has anybody talked to you about, you know, using your computer, when are, when are you able to do it, do you do it in class, you know, luckily, they don't bring them home yet, I hear that's next year, um, but it got me thinking, I mean, the school librarian where he is at is lovely, she is wonderful, um, but I don't think they're talking to kids about digital citizenship, all forms of it, how to use the internet responsibly, what 
you put out there, how long is that going to stay? How should you be looking at sources? And right now he's only playing math games, but as the years go on, he'll be using the computer more and more. Um, and so I started to do my research. I found this really interesting article um, from School Library Research 2019 talking about, well, whose responsibility is it to teach digital citizenship? And it's the school librarians, or at least they're the ones that are thinking about it and thinking about how can we get this message out there. Um, and so the idea in my mind, let's see what happens in a couple of months, guys, <laughs> but it's to kind of create a lib guide, you know, um, with different resources, not only curriculums and, okay, what can we be doing, but what's actually out there? What do we need to be teaching them about? You know, AI is here. So that's something that's not really being addressed yet. And so we need updated resources for school librarians to be able to having these conversations. We need to talk about, yes, this is how you're supposed to use the computer responsibly. And also, hey, this is, you saw this article, let's talk about how we can look at that and see if that's a, a factual article. Is that real information? You know, let's evaluate our sources. Everything that we already do and are pros at, but let's make sure our resources are up to date, that we're relaying the information to these kids about what's out there now, not what was out there 10 years ago, because you know what, that's probably gone and the next thing is already on its way. So just kind of to keep a, a, a updated guide for everybody out there to, to teach the lessons that are so important for the kids today. So awesome. And I do want to apologize to Kate for mispronouncing oh, your last right. name. As soon as I said Blame it, my husband. I knew I was it. Finally, I could, nobody I messed that up. <laughs> So if you would like to know more, a project that was uh, sparked by Dr. Belenza is our School Library Research Informing Practice podcast. And we've been thrilled that so far two of our fellows have been guests um, for our podcast and hopefully more of them will soon. And our main uh, prod podcast branch are with researchers across the world. Our goal is we are working with IASLs, um, SIG, to get this off the ground. So far, um, it's been Dr. Belenza and myself recording with researchers such as Keith Lance, Deb Cockle, Carol Kulfau, and her daughter, uh, Leslie Maniotes, as well as Margaret Murga and uh, April Dawkins. So this has been a very exciting project and uh, that QR will take you to our page on YouTube. We also have it on Spotify as well. Dr. Valenza, if you want to say anything about that. Not about, the, not about that, but I just want to, um, I, do, I do want to mention how powerful it is that students are really in, investigating their environment and taking action and being so creative. I hope that those of you are here and, and even you yourselves see the importance of hitting the start button when you see an issue. I wanna to talk to Rachel about the, you know, this, this is the most important research project your kids will do in their K-12 <laughs> experience. And everything else builds into that and, and how important it is to, to frame it as a research project. Mm -hmm. But all of you, I'm thinking about the, you know, the, the awards that people won at this conference you can win. And you planted the seeds for this stuff. And I wanted Jessica, for instance, you are Miss Rumpheus. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, 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 um, so I think that you are off to a very good start. We're really proud of all of you. And we're hoping that um, you've done the shows um, beautifully. They're going to be proud of you too when we meet with so. them in April. Yes. Um, and I wonder, um, those of you who are not a shown fellow at this moment, but are interested in research, do we have a minute or two? We're, we're, out, of we're out of time. But this but, is the QR to our main LibGuide um, from, from our Sizzle LibGuide. Um, there is a page just for shown and every one of our fellows projects are indexed there with the bio um, that our students wrote at the time they were doing their research as well. So thank you so much for your attention. And Dr. Valenza, go ahead. Anything else you wanted to say? Oh, I want sex cards. I mean, like I'm so excited. <laughs> and I also, I mean, I'll, I'll stop the recording. <laughs> thank you all for coming. Thank you.